Welcome back to Red Cedar Radar. Today marks our 15th episode of RCR, so that's super exciting. I have a very special guest on today for all of our listeners. Um, some of you may know him from Twitter, uh, at Spartan Hoops underscore DK. He runs uh, the website Spartan Hoops and really, in my opinion, is a little bit of a expert and kind of a hype man in the area of Spartan basketball. I know him from his kind of post-game videos. I'm a big fan of those. They always get me hyped up after a big win or kind of console me in the right ways after a loss. Um, How are you today, David? I'm doing so well. Thanks for having me on, Sydney. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about Spartans Hoops and kind of how you got started being maybe I would say like a little bit of a viral uh, Spartan fan on Twitter. Give me the background on kind of where you started with all of this. Yeah, so I guess like love for basketball was very early. Played all the way through. I didn't end up playing in college because I went to Michigan State, uh, but kind of still always had a passion just for the game. Um, I coached for a little while too back at my alma mater for a period after college. So uh, just love being around the sport and kind of found Twitter late. Uh, but I saw Chris Castellani doing these videos on the Tigers. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, nobody does that for Spartan like sports in general. Uh, typically try to stay in my lane because hoops is definitely that. Not as much football, even though, you know, every once in a while for a big win there. But, yeah, just kind of developed out of that. And then COVID hit and work slowed down. You know, I was, I was getting mm-hmm. to kind of leave the office pretty early. And I said, well, not. So I uh, yeah. sunk some money into a website and started kind of writing and built a little team out. So, It's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. Just the community in general is great. It's a ton of passionate fans, and Mm -hmm. uh, I've been thankful just to be able to interact with them uh, on a basically daily basis. So, Yeah, awesome, awesome. Um, Without further ado, I'd kind of like to get started. So David and I today are going to recap MSU's season as a whole and kind of look ahead to maybe some predictions about who might stick around for next season and then who is coming in as new um, kind of new starters for the 2023-2024 season. So, David, I wanted to start with the KSU game recap. Unfortunate game, of course. You know, you never wanted to end in the Sweet 16. Um, tell me some standout points that you have from that game. Yeah, I think first off, what you can take some encouragement from was A.J. Hogar's performance. Uh, 26 points, 6 assists. Uh, 25 points, I'm sorry. He ends up going 7 for 14 from the field, 10 for 11 from the free throw line. He splits from beyond the arc. I thought that late he was leaned on to get buckets, crucial ones, to, to help put it into overtime. Obviously, Walker's the one who kind of had that left-handed finish that, that placed him into overtime, but Hogarth had a couple big buckets before that. I thought that this general tournament appearance for him was basically everything that you can hope for. He never let his play get out of pocket to the point where it dramatically affected the rest of the roster. We saw that during parts of the season where when he spiraled, the team kind of spiraled, and I thought he kind of kept it within the lanes for most of the games. And then he had a primetime performance against um, one of the best you know, college point guards that we saw in the tournament, Marquise Noel. He, he really came close to matching that effort. Fell a little short as a team, but I think – um, there's some real bright spots to take up. Aikens obviously played extremely well. I think he hit like three or four threes that game. I thought he kind of bounced back after a couple shaky first two games. And I think generally there's some pieces in the foundation of this team that you have to be excited about heading into next season. Um, and I think that part of the reason why they lost was unfortunately some of the issues that they've had in various spots in the season. And that really relates to you know some of the lack of athleticism in the front court. Um, this is a team that just didn't have a lot of, a lot of athletes at four and five spot. Um, and despite how well the center spot played the first two games, uh, Cooper particularly in the USC game and then Maddie in, in the Marquette game, uh, only seven points and four rebounds from the center spot in a must-win type situation. It just wasn't enough. And there's some hope that guys can take a step forward uh, heading into it. And there's some guys coming in that are going to help shore up maybe some of that athleta- athleticism that, that was lacking on this roster. But I think you know there, there's good things to take away, but also you know the, the center spot, which we worried about being a problem and was in spots this season, uh, kind of came back to bite them a little bit uh, this game, unfortunately. 
Yeah, I mean, you never want to see a loss, like I mentioned, but I felt like after the game, it didn't leave a bad taste in my mouth about what was coming in the future. It was a good showing, and something that I've talked about on previous episodes was A.J. Hogard's um, maturity and kind of how that's developed over the past last year and then the beginning of this year. I think at the end of this season, we saw a really good picture of what a mature A.J. Hogard can do for the team and kind of him as a, I don't know, like a pillar or a leadership role kind of cemented for the team. And I was happy about that for him because that was something I'd been wanting from his performance all the way through. So I couldn't agree agree. more. I think that that's a great point. I mean, he he has had spurts where he has looked a bit, you know, like a spoiled child, just body language (laughs) has been bad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I thought he cleaned up that towards the end, and I couldn't agree more with you. It seemed to kind of solidify, and I think that this run was important um, for a guy like him to know, like, okay, if I really do buy into all the stuff that Coach has been in my ear about game after game, year after year, like, this is possible. So I, I think that the winning streak was very important for the staff and the program as a whole, but also very important for him to see, like, this is the type of effort that's required to go on a run in March. Um, And you can't just simulate that. That's something that comes with experience. So I think you're spot on there. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so I want to take a step back from March Madness and look at kind of the tough non-conference schedule um, that the Spartans went through early. Talk to me about your feelings on how all of that played out and kind of the injuries that came along with it. The injuries is just part of basketball, and so it's unavoidable. And they took some losses coming directly off that Portland tournament, kind of flirted with danger two games in there, uh, I think, as a result of those injuries. And that's not something you can predict. You would hope that maybe there's a little bit more depth on the roster, so when something like that happens, you can kind of rise above it. But we rolled into the season with 10 guys, and when two of your you know, main seven, basically six with a re- uh, rotation at the center spot get injured, Like, the team is going to suffer. Um, I think we saw some guys develop as a result of that. I thought Trey Holloman showed in some spots that he was capable of being leaned on. Although it didn't work out for Pierre Brooks, the two games that he had, the last two games in the Portland tournament, he actually played well. He scored 15 both games, and really without, you know, him kind of putting some buckets in, Michigan State probably drops one of those games to either Oregon and Portland. Um, So it was a scenario where I think that they kind of developed – Um, a little bit. I think that they got tougher and got bonded together during that non-conference. The Kentucky win was big. Uh, They fell a little short that Gonzaga game, but they were in it to the very end. And I think that they kind of set the tone early in the season. They lost themselves somewhere along the way where they they lost some of that toughness in defense. Um, But I think that it was spots of just inconsistency that we saw across the rest of the season. And the non-conference was part and hold of that. When the team was playing at its very highest level, compete with anyone in the country and when they weren't quite up to snuff and they got banged up a little bit uh they're a team that you know looked maybe like closer to a fringe tourney team which in some spots we got scared of so yeah definitely I feel like there was lots of ups and downs with the ways that I was feeling and I think the injuries played a big part into that throughout the season that worried me I was I didn't know and I feel like tell me if you agree with this or not I feel like Hall never fully came back 100%. Would you agree or disagree? Yeah, I agree completely. I I didn't think the explosiveness was there. He just didn't look like himself. I mean, he was, I think he was banged up before the season started that he got injured after, then he got injured again. Like he just, Mm -hmm. unfortunately the end to the last two seasons for him, he has not been healthy. He wasn't healthy in the March run last year. And it's, I feel a bit gutted because I think that there's a really good version of him that's you know close, if not a, an all-conference player, and we haven't gotten to see it quite peak. And I wonder if that'll factor in his decision. I, you know, that's that's something to be considered where he didn't quite to get to go out on his own terms. Uh, so I guess we'll have to wait and see. You know, kind of what he what he feels like doing. Is he burnt out, or does he he still want to kind of go back at it one more season and see if he could put something complete together? Yeah, definitely. I will be curious about his choice there. I think it could go either way. Um, Speaking of whole season, kind of to end this little segment here, what in your opinion was MSU's worst loss? Man, probably the Iowa game. That's that's probably the easiest one to pick. They had him on the ropes, and that just the the way that it ended – 
Uh, it kind of felt like we'd seen that too many times on the road mm-hmm. for Michigan State. And was that what they were going to be at the end of the year? Um, that was a little bit just deflating. Um, so I, I'm going to go with that one probably. Yeah, from a fan perspective, definitely. That was terrible. I was pretty upset after that one. Um, I'll, the only other one would be, for me, Notre Dame. It was just a... The was blown off. And Notre yeah, Dame was yeah. terrible all year. <laughs> Yeah, they didn't show up for that game, and it was hard to watch because that's not usually what I expect from that team or from a Tom Izzo team in general. So that one was hard to watch. But, yeah, the Iowa game was difficult the to come to terms with. Game, the Big Ten tournament game could be in that category, too, because it didn't yeah. look like they showed up off the bus for that one for the most yeah. part. And it's, uh, that was a little disappointing in, in that situation. So, yeah. But they kind of revived it with the tournament run that they had. Right. They kind of right. washed that bad taste out of the mouth. So Definitely. Yeah, I was there for that game in Chicago. So, again, from a fan perspective, that was another sad one to witness in front of your eyes. Um, especially sitting next to some Purdue fans because they were a little insufferable. But we won't get into that. Um, they got theirs. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Okay. Contrasting the worst loss, tell me what you think their best win was. Best win? Um, it's got to be the Marquette game, I think. To, to go into that game, you know, basically – knowing that they're going to have to play pretty perfect on both sides of the ball to come out with that win. Marquette was rolling. I think they won 15 of their last 16 games. So to come in that against a hot team that had been playing well, to execute a great defensive plan, they got in Kolick's head and really just didn't let him be part of the game. He got into some foul trouble. Um, and he's been great this season, one Big East player of the year, and they made him look like complete garbage. I thought the game plan defensively on Boogie Ellis and Kolick were fantastic. Um, so I, I think it's got to be that one because making the Sweet 16 for this program after there's been a bit of a gap. I know it's only been two years, a two actual tournaments since, um, you know, the 2019. But then before that to have, you know, 16, 17, 18, you don't make it out of the first weekend. So I think it was good for the program to regain some of that mojo. Uh, so that one's probably a, an easy one to circle and say. But if we're going to go just regular season, um I don't know maybe one single game, but I would say that what was different about this team than the teams in the previous two years is every time they kind of got themselves into a backs against the wall situation in terms of their record in the Big Ten Conference, they found a way to win. They did that yeah. against Rutgers at home. They did against Maryland at home, Iowa at home. Most of, most of those games were unfortunately at home. That PSU game early, they kind of needed to mm-hmm. have and that actually ended up being a pretty good win. So I think that the, the team finding like that pressure situation in performing, even though it wasn't always on the road, has to give you some comfort again about building blocks for where it's heading in the future. Yeah, the PSU game was going to be my kind of regular season Big Ten game because they got, like we said, smacked by Notre Dame. And then Boo Booey, unfortunately, put the beat down at home. Michigan State killer. Yeah. Yeah, so then it was nice to see them have a nice win on the road against Penn State, and that kind of gave me a little more hope for the rest of the Big Ten season and, you know, looking into the It was post-season. a roller coaster. It felt yeah. like win a game or two and then take a step mm-hmm. back, win a game or two and take a step back. And I think that was just maybe the feeling for almost every team outside of Purdue this year in the yeah. conference. Just yeah. it was a complete grind. Yeah, definitely. So this – we didn't kind of pre-plan this, but I have a question for you. I was seeing on Twitter a lot, and you we were talking about the Sweet 16 and kind of um, – getting to that point and how it was nice to kind of regain that level that the the teams had been at in previous years. My philosophy about getting to the Sweet 16 is, you know, that's a win in ex- in itself. Obviously, I'm not going to celebrate a Sweet 16 loss. People on Twitter were kind of going back and forth about it. To you, how much does getting to a Sweet 16 mean? I think that it's circumstantial. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's always tough. Like if Purdue had lost a close one in the second round, but they won the big 10 tournament and the big 10 title, even though they're a one seed, do they feel good about that? Probably better than losing to a 16. I think that you always want to hang banners and that is probably a more steady measure of exactly what you are every year. But for this program in that moment, I think that, um, winning a Big Ten title and then not making a Sweet 16 probably would have fallen short for me. 
Again, mm-hmm. I agree with you. It's not something that you're just absolutely thumping the chest about, but I think that there's some like relief that it, it headed in that right direction, that they beat a team that they weren't supposed to. They haven't really done it right. as much recently. And now this kind of gives you the confidence that, okay, Izzo still has the fastball. He can still mm-hmm. game plan with the best of them. Um, there's pieces on the roster that have now made a second week and have gotten that monkey off their back. And again, if you can kind of build towards this foundation with some of the talent that's coming in next year, um, then earn a higher seed to give yourself a better shot to advance further, put yourself in a better position next season. And the expectation will again to make the sec- second weekend, but then you hope that the expectation is to go a little further. So it's kind of where I'm at with it. Yeah, I want to go down this rabbit hole just a little bit farther. This is something else that okay. I've seen some debate on, and then we can get back to kind of sure. MSU season. So I was reading something where somebody said, you know, none of the none of the best teams are in the Final Four this year. And I kind of don't like that because I think what they're meaning is the most notable teams or like, you know, the famous names that we know aren't in the Final Four. But I feel like, although it may be a little bit circumstantial, like you said, I feel like the best teams are in the final four because they won. What's your opinion on that whole debate? Yeah, I think that when you look at that first matchup uh, with FAU and San Diego State, like that's not a sexy matchup. It's not going to sell viewership. It's not going to be from a big conference and you're bringing a bunch of eyeballs in. But if you watch that San Diego State-Alabama game, they physically dominated them for 40 minutes. Alabama came into that rolling had more talent on paper, had, you know, the lottery pick in Brandon Miller, and were physically outmatched and just beat down by that team. So I agree with you. FAU was able to outlast Kansas State. Um, I thought they did a much better job containing the cuts, making Noel kind of beat them over the top himself. Um, And I thought that the game plan for them was just, again, to play extremely physical around the rim. Uh, and and make life hard on guys scoring easy buckets in the lane, which Michigan State wasn't able to do. These teams are completely deserving to me. Uh, Florida Atlantic was definitely underseeded. San Diego State, um, again, just came to play. They have a, you know, a bunch of grown guys on that roster. And when you have a bunch of vets and guys that are ready to play, um, you know, good things can happen. So I, I'm with you. I think that the teams that showed their worthiness are in the final, even though, you know, if we had gotten something different, some sexier names, I think that would be maybe more aesthetically enjoyable because that game is going to just be like a trench fight first one to 60. Uh, so I, you know, it's kind of a combination. And then the next game is probably going to be a little bit higher scoring, a little bit more guard play. It'll be more aesthetically pleasing. So you're going to see two contra- contrasting styles. I think, does it take a little bit of shine off the national title game? Probably, but do I think if San Diego State wins, and I, I'm leaning towards UConn probably beating Miami as well, like that's two styles where there's, you know, San Diego State is going to have a good game plan for them, and I think that they can keep it closer than maybe we anticipate, so we'll have to see. Yeah, I just wanted to know your opinion, because that's been something that I've been seeing people, you know, fight about on Twitter, so I was curious what your thoughts were. Yeah, deserving, maybe not the most enjoyable, but um, yeah. you know, yeah. it's an eye of the beholder. So Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, so back to MSU ball here a little bit. I would kind of just like to do a little bit of a quick run through on the roster of MSU's team this year. And you just tell me some quick thoughts on each of these players as we go through. So I just went in line with jersey numbers, so let's start with Kohler. Any quick thoughts about him? Yeah, showed some flashes in the low post. He obviously has a pretty capable package. I think that he got a little hesitant about scoring over length and strength at times. Um, lost a little bit of touch. When he when he thought less on the block, I thought that he made good moves. He was decisive. He got to his spots and scored. Um, defensively, it was always going to be a bit of a question mark for him. I thought that the offensive side of the ball was going to weigh it out, and he would kind of develop that a little bit more. Um, it, Didn't play much down the tournament run. Cooper kind of took some of those minutes. I think it was mostly on the defensive side. Um, You know, he got in for some spot minutes here and there. He's a guy that's got to work his butt off this offseason. He's got to get stronger. He's got to get a little bit quicker, get in a little bit better shape. I think that there's still a very good player in there. I'm curious to see how it all develops for him because he's got to add some muscle. He's got to get a little bit bigger. I think he's in the right spots positionally. 
Um, but he's just got to get some of his confidence back from the end of the season. And again, he, he's a guy that can give buckets there. And Michigan State absolutely needs that from him because there's not really a guy on the roster that can give it to him. So he's a, he's a big piece, a big development piece heading into next season. Yeah, I kind of have a picture of some of these guys like Kohler, Holloman, Cooper. They're, I don't know if this is the right term, but like Izzo has a process where he develops guys. I think back to like, you know, images that I saw of Matt McQuaid when he first started, you know, scrawny little Matt McQuaid, and then his senior year. And he's, he had gone through the development of Izzo's process, and I feel like those are guys that I want to see them after a couple of years of that development, the getting stronger, the building the muscle. And I'm excited about them because, like you said, we saw flashes of some of those things that, you know, are foundations of things that they can maybe build on for future years. Hi. It's me, Sydney, interrupting uh, the, you know, reg regularly scheduled programming. DK and I recorded this on um, March 28th, and just pretty much as I was about to post the video, um, Pierre Brooks, sophomore at MSU on the basketball team, um, posted out on the internet that he was entering the transfer portal. So I want to just kind of just put this update in the middle of the episode um, so that our information is up to date. DK and I had kind of gone back and forth about what we thought about Pierre, what Pierre might do and kind of his plans moving forward, but things were confirmed very quickly before I could get the video posted. So there's your little bit of tidbit of current events. Pierre Brooks is now in the transfer portal, which I think maybe is a good move for him and his career going forward. Okay, back to the video. Moving on to Walker. Give me some points about Tyson Walker. Special. I mean, second team all conference looked like a guy, you know, that could be one of the better scoring guards in the country in spots this year. You know, he played spectacular during the tournament, a clutch shot maker from all three levels. Uh, he really had the season that I, you know, to a certain degree thought he could maybe last year. Um, and maybe he even exceeded my expectations after the full season. I think we're so prone to putting so much pressure on guys that immediately transfer, but the guys who end up staying places for two years typically end up doing better their second year than their first, getting integrated into a new system. He was playing point guard in spots because AJ wasn't quite up to snuff um, for parts of that first year. And so I think moving him off ball did wonders for his game. He was just more hunting shots. I thought his confidence was there where in spots last year it wasn't. Um, and so we'll see what he ends up deciding. There's some chatter that maybe he's back. Uh, if he is, there's going to be some, some ripple effect to probably that decision. But I think overall, if you can get a guy like that back, um, first team, all Big Ten potential next year, a guy that can really carry the scoring load and continue to build on what we saw, which is a guy that just makes big buckets and is ready for the big moment. Yeah, I'm not a bas basketball expert, so this may not be the right take for sure, but he gives me those Cassius Winston vibes when it when he can drive to the basket and make something that I'm not sure is going to go in, and he just kind of has that finesse that he just tips it in at the end, and I think we saw that a little bit in that at the KSU game heading into OT. That just gave me like a flashback moment to Cash is making those kind of shots that you're not quite sure are going to happen. They, they don't have the same exact game, but it just gives me a little bit of those same sparks that I had when Cash just was around. Yeah, so, I, I yeah. think, you know, two guys that are a little bit undersized, they have to be creative yeah. around the rim the way that they score. And I think that Tyson, particularly when he went left this year, was just fantastic at finding yeah. ways to score on bigger guys. And Cash was a master with that. So I can mm -hmm. see, you know, that type of comparison for sure. Yeah, okay. Next up, Jaden Akins. Yeah, love Jaden Akins. Um, have loved him since high school. I got to watch him at Farmington before he went to um, uh, the prep academy. It's on the tip of my tongue. I can't think of it. Uh, Sunrise, thank you. Sunrise Christian Academy. So before he went there, I got to watch him uh, his junior year. And a guy that I was very high on was hoping that he committed to the program. When he did, I was super excited. I thought we saw the development for him. Uh, the three-point shooting has exceeded all expectations. I thought he was going to be more of a streaky shooter. He really has been pretty knocked down. A uh, guy that can kind of get it in bunches. Defensively, extremely good. What he did with Boogie Ellis late with Noel, I think that should have maybe gone to that earlier, where defensively I thought he put the clamps on him in some spots. Uh, rebounds, hustles, 
and really played a, a role that maybe he wasn't expecting to do because technically Tyson wasn't supposed to be on the roster when he was actually committed to Michigan State. So I think that he's played pretty selflessly these last two years. I, I think that he's a guy that's capable and wants a bigger role with the offense. Um, and so as we talked about with Tyson Walker, if he comes back, one of the ripple effects is that is can you sell Akins on coming back and playing a similar role where he's maybe looking to hopefully make a leap to the NBA eventually, needs the ball in his hands a little bit more. So I think it's a scenario where uh, it would really stink to lose him if Walker did come back. I'd, I'd hope that the staff makes obviously the best decision for the program and, and the kids in it. Um, you'd hope that that could be squared away with him where you could sell him that maybe this is a national title contending roster if he comes back with the guys that are back. Um, but that's uh, a decision, again, that if Walker does decide to come, I think that there's serious consideration for him to maybe look for a bigger role. And um, that is the name of the game in this, this day and age. It's hard to keep guys happy in team type roles when they have some expectations for bigger things. And so balancing that is just part of the new world. And uh, I guess we'll just kind of hold our breath to see if, if he, you know, if he doesn't come back, Walker doesn't come back. I think Aiken slides pretty naturally into that two spot role plays back into a position. He's maybe more comfortable doing or has a bigger desire to do. And I, I think that the combination of AJ and Jaden can also be effective and he can kind of slide a bit into that, uh, Walker role, hopefully maintaining some of the efficiency that we saw from Walker this season. That's a really good point. I sometimes get blinded when I want guys to come back because they're likable guys and they bring a lot to the team, but I don't always think about what that means for the guys that have kind of been like grinding underneath some of those, you know, players that we saw a lot make a lot of moves this past year. So that's a good point, and I should remember that when I'm, you know, commenting and thinking about that in the future. Yeah, Something it's that tough. I. Yeah. It's tough. If, if Akins does end up deciding to transfer, like that's going to be a blow to the program. He's a program type kid, you know, like grew up wanting to play Michigan State basketball and got the chance to do so. So you always are going to hurt to lose that type of kid if it ended up happening yeah. that way. Um, but you just have to hope that the staff knows best what's for the roster um, and for the program in general and whatever ends up happening decision wise. Uh, if they could get back the three-headed guard trio, which I think was very excellent in spots mm -hmm. this year, uh, I, there's a lot to be excited about with those three. I, I really thought just across the entire country, it was one of the better trios. Guys just don't have that many good guards on the roster. We saw what kind of run you can do when you lean on that guard play. And so to have them all somehow, all three come back, would be insane with, with Jeremy Fierce Jr. coming in. So we'll – yeah. We'll see. We'll, we'll cross our fingers and see. <laughs> yeah. Okay, moving on. Trey Holloman, what is your opinion of him after this season? Yeah, so I thought in some spots he did well under pressure situations, taking care of the ball. Um, that's kind of what he was asked to do. Uh, he was a high-level passer and high-level scorer in high school. I don't know what the level of competition was in Minnesota at, at the level he was playing at. Uh, but he's a guy that won Gatorade Player of the Year, averaging, I think, 18 or 19 points, seven or eight assists, three steals, a couple blocks. He filled the stat sheet, and he did not do that this season. I was hoping to see maybe a little bit more flash with that. I think that he realized some of his PT and the way towards PT was just playing within himself and not making mistakes. But I would have liked to see in the later part of the season maybe him slide into a more aggressive role. We saw him take some shots and hit a couple kind of late um, but really, you know, he took one shot or so a game. Like, it just wasn't enough, I think, uh, for him to clearly carve out a significant role next year, particularly, again, with Jeremy Fierce Jr., who I know we're going to get to coming in. Um, he needs to have a, a big offseason. He needs to become more aggressive because um, I think that he can score with some of his length. He's extremely long, 6'3". He's a guy that can show the ability to finish in a variety of ways in the paint, at least he could in high school. He needs to continue to work on his confidence and continue to just have a little bit more of a killer mentality offensively because in a lot of circumstances, they're playing four or five out there, and he's really just moving the ball, and that can't happen next year. He's got to take a step forward, so that's really what I'm looking forward this offseason to seeing what part of his offensive game develops because I think the rest of it's there. Uh, it's just a matter of him finding you know, his go-to spots and getting there more frequently. 
Yeah, I, I, there was moments that I would categorize as him as timid throughout this season. He just kind of, there were opportunities maybe for him to take that next step and take some more shots, but you're right, you're right, he kind of defaulted back to just moving the ball and being kind of like a background player often. So I look forward to seeing his development also. Okay, next, someone near and dear to my heart, Joey Hauser. What are your thoughts about him? Oh, uh, I mean, what a redemption story from his first, you know, couple of years here. He really was the whipping boy for, you know, a lot of the public's ire about the way that the program went. Um, it probably was unfair. Some of it, you know, came from my account, and I definitely apologize to, for him to that because I thought that this season he was the most consistent and steady offensive player that Michigan State had, a guy that you could basically chalk up for near a double-double every night, and Michigan State's probably not a tournament team if he didn't return last year. So uh, just thank him for the year that he had. I'm glad that he got to make a Sweet 16. There is some chatter that there's consideration for him to come back. I thought it was a a long shot, um, but there's some talk that maybe he doesn't want to play overseas or in the G League. So it's really starting a real job or maybe coming back and making some money playing basketball. Um, so it seems as if that's maybe a closer to 50, 50 decision, which would be wild. Uh, we would obviously love to have him back and whatever he ends up deciding, I think, you know, he's clearly a fan favorite this season for the Spartans and a guy that really is what college basketball is all about. He kept grinding and he found a way to kind of get over the hump, uh, both mentally and physically for the type of player that he was. So fantastic season from him. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we won't dwell on that because I could talk about Joey all day. But moving on to A.J. Hogard, another guy that I really think, you know, stepped up and exceeded my expectations this season. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think he closed well in the tournament like we had previously talked about. I think, again, there was some roller coaster with him. There were some games where he didn't play well. It spiraled the offense. The team didn't play well. I mean, that was, um, you know, a bit of a storyline, but I think that he finished strong. And I think, again, he's a guy that's been going through the process with Izzo. I'd like to believe that this breakthrough into the Sweet 16 is kind of him getting over the hump. Um, he's a senior this next year. And again, I, I think that you could have, you know, the keys to the castle, uh, of the offense in in a lot worse hands heading into next season. I think that he showed a lot. He's a guy that that hit some clutch buckets late and, again, just uh, found the guys that he needed to 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 generate offense. There's a lot to like. He shot well from the free throw line, shot pretty close to 33% from deep this season. So that's something that you want to see maybe take another bump up if he can just even be a 35% shooter on two or three shots a game. He's going to keep defenses a little bit more honest. I think he can still get in a little bit better shape. There were some spots where I thought maybe he looked a little tired out there, so I'd like to see that effort continue as well. But I think that the team is in pretty good hands with him, and I think he is going to like what's coming in this freshman class. Some guys are going to be able to finish above the rim for him pretty consistently. So I'm excited to see kind of how he gels with some of the new pieces that will be coming in. Yeah, definitely. I felt like whereas Joey was maybe like the stoic leader sometimes for the team, AJ was really doing a good job of getting on guys and pushing them to kind of get to their spots and be where they're supposed to be. Um, I saw on multiple occasions where he was, you know, on guys' case and then congratulating them after, you know, doing something right. So he was on their case as a leader should be, but then also, you know, applauding them when guys were doing the right thing. So a leadership role cemented in my mind more and more for him throughout the season so I'm excited for his senior year I agree with that I I don't know if he quite earned the captainship early in the year but I thought by the mid to late point he started playing more like a Michigan State point guard yeah definitely okay moving on to Carson Cooper Coop I love Cooper I'll just I'll say off the bat um I think the most two-way upside at the center spot right now I think Maddie had a pretty nice season. I know we'll touch on him, but I think that what Cooper flashed in terms of his hands, his ability to wall up defensively, I think, you know, laterally he moves the best of the three, probably the best in the pick and roll defensive coverage. 
needs to put some weight on. I think, you know, an extra 10, 15 pounds on his frame would really do a lot for him. Still had some of his puppy paws early on in the season, but he had a spurt. And I think it was the Illinois game where Holloman was in and kind of fed him the ball, like near the three point line on the fast break. And he took a dribble and put one, two down and just crammed it. And I was like, okay, there's not any other guy on the roster that can do that. I would have liked to see him play a little bit more late in the regular season. They kind of went away from him, and I thought that that was a poor mistake, but they kind of went back to him for the tournament, and I thought that was 100% the right. Um, that USC game, I thought he gave him great minutes, and he's a guy that I think with the right development and a little bit more PT has the capability of rounding into a Big Ten starting caliber center. I don't think there was one on the roster this year. Uh, I, I don't know if it's going to be next year. If, if it is, we're going to be in much better shape, I think, with the roster as a whole than if it's not. But he's a guy, to me, that's got to play closer to 15 to 20 minutes next year if Michigan State's uh, going to be better at that center position. So I'm really, really excited to see his development. I hope that the staff really leans into giving him more run with the starters because I think he's a guy that – uh, can raise Michigan State's ceiling on both ends uh, in the future. Yeah, perfect summary. I'm excited about his development as well. Okay, next up, Sissoko. What are your thoughts on him based on this past season? Yeah, so just right out of the gates, the UK in the Gonzaga game like played out of his mind. Um, I thought that was maybe a little bit exceeding some expectations that there was going to be a return to earth. I think we saw that for large parts of the season. Uh, the consistency wasn't always there. To me, he was a guy that there was too many games where I, you know he played 20-plus minutes but only had two or three boards. That That's unacceptable at that position, especially for a guy as physical um, and as athletic as he is. I think, again, he's still learning kind of the, the way that basketball is being played schematically. He's learning how to play within himself. Uh, a great screen setter and a guy that I think is an energy backup type big we wouldn't maybe be as hard on him this season as we were. I think that really was a decision by the coaching staff, um, you know, to roll into the season with, with this center rotation. There was going to be some bumps and bruises along the way, and we saw that. Um, but he played extremely well that Marquette game. The, the upside flashes are still there. A very capable and competent player that you want to see playing 15 minutes per game. Um, you know, I, I don't know if he has more in the tank than what we saw. I think that he can become a little bit more consistent. So at least we're seeing more eight and six nights, you know, uh, nine and seven, that type of thing. Uh, but is he ever going to be a top half conference Big Ten center? I don't, I don't know about that. So I think that maybe as, as long as the expectations set for him, that he's really more of that energy guy, that backup guy that can come in and give you a boost every time he's on the floor. I like that role for him maybe more than him playing 20, 25 minutes next season. So I, I think that the role will define how we feel about him, but I think that there was really a lot of bright spots during the course of the season. Just some of the consistency was lacking, and, and that has to change heading into next year. Truly more bright spots this season for him than I was expecting. So, I mean, only up from here for him maybe, um, but I like – uh, that kind of energy role for him, as you as you put it. I think that's perfect. Okay, last up on our kind of roster breakdown here, we have Malik Hall. I know we touched on him a bit earlier, but just give a couple points on him. Yeah, so in spots, just really good offensively. His ability to be able to score on the low block and kind of that little turnaround jumper that he was hitting. I thought he started the season and looked, you know, like one of the better versions of him that we've gotten that first, like, four or five games. Then he gets injured, then he comes back, then he gets injured. Um, it's just tough. I think that it's hard to really give him a grade this season because he just never looked quite healthy, like you said, down the stretch. And it's hard um, to know how hurt he was versus maybe some of the mental part of it, which I think that he struggled with a little bit too, just locking in some of the consistency. So I, I don't know what he's going to do. Again, a guy that I think could come back or could maybe just be done with hoops. Um, so it's a scenario where, again, we kind of just have to wait and see how that shakes out. But if he can get healthy, if he can really give you a full and consistent season because he can play either the three or the four next year, which I think is a necessary piece on the roster, um, he's a guy that I'd be excited to have back uh, as long as you know he's physically and mentally able to play another season. 
Izzo called him, I think, like a calming presence on the team. And I feel like he will ha- he will bring experience. If he brings that calming presence, that will be good for the next group that's coming in because it's always nice to have that um, kind of experience built up on your roster when you're bringing in a bunch of new guys. But you're right. I hope that he makes the best choice for him going forward, and we will see. And I'm assuming, you know, that decision will come out in the not-too-near future. So not too whatever, distant future, sorry, (laughs) and we'll see. Okay, so after kind of doing that whole roster review, who for you was MSU's MVP this past season? Yeah, that's got to be Tyson for me. I think without his scoring, kind of lifting the rest of the roster, we saw some spots in the season it just gets so stagnant. Um, What he brings was not really elsewhere to be found, and I thought that he had a pretty special season, all things considered, um, the way that he played. So I'm going to go with Tyson on that one. Yeah, I would agree. Only other one would be Joey. Just as we mentioned before, because he was kind of that solid presence all year. Although I don't think Tyson is different from that. I think he he wasn't injured. He played, you know, the whole time, that whole year. I saw more from him at the end of the season, which not that the end of of the season is more important, but those are the games where you you win or you go home. So that's when it mattered. Not that Joey's play all season long didn't matter, but I agree with your take. I think we wouldn't have made it as far without his shooting, um, and Walker really stepped up. So kind of closing the chapter on the 2022-23 season, I want to look ahead at who's coming in next and who you predict just off the cuff will stay on MSU's roster for next season. So let's start there. Who will stay? Give your predictions. Oh man, I've been so torn. I've really been trying to dig in and see if anybody can leak that information to me, but I have not found it yet. So, um, my gut is saying that I think Tyson could come back. I think that Hauser's going to go. That's just a gut feel for me. He turns 23 in July. I think they'll make a push at him, but I, I, I still would be surprised if he came back. Hall, to me, is a toss-up. Um, I think if Hauser ends up going, you probably you know try to ensure that maybe Hall returns as well, again, because he can plug that 3-4, but uh, I don't know where he's at mentally and with his body to have have two seasons in a row where you finish and you, you know you're just not quite healthy. Um, that's got to be tough. So I, I don't know where he's at mentally with it. So I'm gonna I'm not gonna make a prediction on him. He's a coin flip, but my gut's telling me I, I think that Tyson ends up coming back for the roster. I know there was that comment on Instagram and everyone was freaking out about it. Me maybe included in that. We won't reveal that for sure, but. I just feel like he has unfinished business, and I think he's the type of person, I don't know him at all, so this is just like a total guess, but I feel like he's the type of person that will want to come back and finish what they kind of had going for them this season and what he had going for himself in the postseason in March Madness. I don't know. That's that's what I yeah, feel Yeah, I agree, him. and I think that with Michigan State's NLI – um, you know, kind of, mm-hmm. kind of in a spot where maybe they can pay him some money to stick around another year or two. I think that changes it. You know, he's he's probably gonna have to play overseas. Maybe he would make a G League roster to start, but yeah. I think that you know the best path forward for him making real money would probably be overseas. And if you can stay closer to home and make a few hundred k, I don't I don't think that that's a bad deal either. So we'll have to yeah. see what he decides. Isn't that so crazy how much that has changed that whole decision-making process at the end of your time? That's, I need to consider that more often. I'm not used to thinking that way, but that's such a big component on if they will come back or not. And I think MSU has established themselves enough in that area where it's guaranteed that those guys will get good money while they're still you know, playing in college and getting their degrees and stuff. So... That's something I need to consider more, and I'm glad you brought that up. That's a good point. Okay, so we'll see if your predictions come true as far as that goes. Um, I hope you're right. Maybe I hope you're wrong with Joey. Let's say it that way. Um, Okay, so I am super excited about MSU's new freshman class coming in. There's been a lot of hype around it. Before I kind of go into the nitty-gritty about those players or we get into it, who are you most excited for as far as that new class coming in? So I'm going to answer this 
two parts. I would say the guy that I'm most excited for long-term coming in has to be Jeremy Fierce Jr. I think that the marriage with him and Tom Izzo is a perfect one. A guy that just has such a will to win. Uh, he's a gamer. He, he makes his teammates better. Uh, I got to watch a bunch of the Team USA basketball stuff from this past summer, and he was unbelievable there. He can raise the ceiling for all the rest of his teammates on the roster. I think he's going to be a really, really good college point guard and probably a guy that stays around three or four years because it's some of his size limitations to make the next level. And I think that as he continues to develop, um, he can be a special point guard for Michigan State. So long term, it's got to be fears. It's the most important position on the floor. But in the short term, in the first year of uh, guys who I think can come in and make a dramatic impact on the roster, to me, that's got to be Cohen Carr. He's 6'6", 200 pounds. He's a runaway freight train, 1% college athlete. Um, I'm sure you've seen some of the highlights on Instagram and on Twitter. He's, he's literally a walking, dunking highlight. I think Michigan State's transition offense was a bit slow this year. They don't really have a ton of guys that could finish above the rim. And to get him out in transition with A.J. and Fears and whatever the two-guard spot looks like to get him out running, um, there's just Michigan State didn't score well enough inside the paint. He's a guy that I think has a little better handle than he's probably given credit for. I think he can take a dribble or two, create some space, and get into the lane and finish. Um, the jump shot is still something that he's working on. It's really the swing skill for him. If he ends up being able to knock down 34, 35% from deep over the next couple of years and do it with two or three shots a game, to me, I think he can develop into an NBA player sooner than later. Um, and he's a guy that I think defensively is going to come in and plug so many holes. He, he's a guy that can rim protect um, from the guard wing position, whether he plays the three or the four. Um, I think he can guard one through four. He's probably going to be pound for pound Michigan State's best defensive player next season. I really believe that he has that capability. Um, and for Izzo to get a guy that is kind of built in a mold like Brandon Dawson, where he's just going to be a beast around the rim on both sides, um, but maybe with a little bit more outside game in the bag. Uh, there's sky's the limit for him. I think he went to the exact right place. Michigan State knows exactly what to do with those tweener types. And I think it's it's similar to Fears and Izzo. I think that this is a match made in heaven. Um, a guy that is an SEC type athlete in the Big Ten when there's not a ton of them. Cohen Carr is going to be he's going to be so much fun to watch next season. I mean that Money Ball if they end up doing it again this summer, which they usually do. I will be there for that first game just to watch him take the floor because I think he's worth the price of admission anywhere he goes. He's going to be a ton of fun to see this season. Yeah, his highlights have been amazing. I feel like it was during one of the kind of midseason slumps that the team was having. I was a little bit down about oh, the tournament coming you know, going forward, there was a highlight of him just absolutely slamming the crap out of the ball. And I was like, you know what, there's some solace in the future. I can hold on to that a little bit. So I'm excited about that prospect um, and him coming in. Like, and like you said, filling the holes that, you know, were a little bit evident this past season. Anything that you are worried about with this incoming class? Um, I don't think I'm worried. Um, the other two guys that we haven't touched on, Garrick Norman's probably the least heralded, heralded, I can't even say that word, right? Sorry about that, um, of of the four recruits coming in. But I, I think that he has kind of a sneaky good game. He's 6'6". Uh, he can create a little bit off the dribble. He has a nice pull-up game, a great shooter, a little bit more athleticism. Uh, you know, he's from Texas, so the Matt McQuaid comparisons mm -hmm. have come in. I think he's got a little bit more to his game maybe and not quite the knockdown sharpshooter, even though I think he's very good in that de department as McQuaid was. But I think he's a guy that's going to have to get a little bit more strong. He's got to put some weight on. He's got to lock in defensively to be able to earn more minutes this next season. But if he comes in a game and splashes three or four threes in a game at some point this next year, I don't think I'm going to be surprised in the least bit plays with a lot of swag, and I think he's going to develop into a really nice player, particularly next to Jeremy Fears as they continue their college careers. Fears is going to need some shooting around him, and I think Norman's going to give that. He's a guy that I think will show some flashes this next year, and in a year or two we're going to be talking about him, similar to we have many other of those, those kind of catch-and-shoot guys over the course of the years for Michigan State is a guy that kind of just locks in and you know what you're getting every time he touches the ball. So excited about him. Uh, Xavier Booker, 
the most highly rated recruit of the group, um, has some work to do. He's skinny. He's a little bit raw. I think that there's some questions concerning maybe some of his motor and how you know hard he plays in instances, particularly on the defensive end. That's definitely going to be addressed this offseason and this summer. Um, I think he's got to add a little weight. He's a little skinny right now, 10, 15 pounds easily on his frame, I think will go a long way. Um, but the skill set is special. He's 6'11". He's a lefty. He can step out and shoot the three. He's a guy that can play in the pick and roll and be a rim runner, finish with two hands above the rim. Um, if he has a little bit of space, he can create a little bit off the dribble. Uh, he's a guy that I think in a defined role for Michigan State in the pick and roll um, can really be an interesting piece that they kind of move around. I think he's probably more slated as a power forward right now. I think he would get eaten up a little bit at the center spot. But against certain matchups when they play Iowa or they play some teams with maybe less uh, true low post dominant players, even though that's, that's not that many in the league, um, I think that he can be slid into the five spot and they kind of have a five out look where he gives them a little bit something different that they didn't have this year. So I think that the potential is oozing for him, but it's really going to be a commitment to how hard he's going to work this summer, to how much he really wants to get an earful from Izzo. Uh, there's a really, really talented NBA player in there. Unlocking that, I think, is going to be the task of the staff and particularly Coach Izzo for this season to see what he has. So it, it wouldn't surprise me if he a little bit underwhelms heading into the season for where maybe the ranking expectations are. But I think at the same time that if he somehow sticks around two years, we're really, really going to like the player that he can become. Um, it's just when a guy is rated that highly, there's, there's certain expectations and burdens that are placed on you fairly or not that you need to make that jump to the league shortly um, if he can buy into the process and it starts the moment he hits on campus getting food into him getting him in the weight room um, and then getting him comfortable with the system that they have I, I think he can be a very very good player it's it's really going to be on his shoulders to take that step into where you know he could potentially be heading into next season yeah, I really don't think you sign on for a Tom Izzo program if you're not ready to be put to the test and like put in that hard work. I don't know him. I, I don't know his personality, but I feel like throughout all the process of, you know, recruiting and all of those things, Izzo comes with that reputation. And I hope that um, he can kind of meet the expectations that have been set forth with his ranking and kind of all the hype coming in around him. Um. I don't have too much more about the class coming in. It's kind of a wait and see situation. Um, any points? You probably just watched a couple of them play just tonight um, at the McDonald All American game. Any points that you have? I think maybe just from the first half of that game at all. Yeah, they didn't get a ton of run. Booker really mm -hmm. didn't see much of the ball. Um, he had a nice uh, attempt at a layup and got fouled split the pair at the free throw line and then he had a follow-up layup even though he was running the break and wide open they didn't give it to him so we didn't get to see a flush but the guy drove on somebody he cleaned it up um, his length is apparent the way that he moves is extremely fluid um, again it's it's putting in the weight and the effort this summer and the, the potential is through the roof for him uh, i only saw a couple stints with fears he didn't get a ton of run in the first half had a nice drive that he didn't end up finishing someone else cleaned up. Um, these type of games are not really like set up for a pass first point guard. It's a little bit more pass the ball and watch a guy cook and shoot. So he's not going to be able to really show his skill set in, in the pick and roll and for set plays, which I think he can do. But he's a guy that's going to be able to get downhill frequently. I think he's very similar to AJ in that regard. He's going to have to be a little craftier about finishing because he doesn't have quite the strength or the size. But I think, again, he's a guy that just elevates the teammates around him, capable of getting into the paint and scoring. And he's a guy that's really been working hard on his jump shot. And I think that if that continues to improve, again, um, the future for Michigan State is in really good hands. I'm excited to see what Fierce can be uh, on, in this program because uh, he's he's been compared by Izzo to Mateen Cleaves in terms of just his mentality and his approach to basketball. And I, I really couldn't agree more. I think that the the symmetry between coach and point guard is going to be as good as we've seen it in a long time. And I'm really excited to see what that looks like next year, both backing up AJ as well as maybe even playing beside him in some spots. 
Me too. I'm excited for what's ahead. So first of all, I want to say it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast today. Um, you bring such a wealth of knowledge, and I love um, that you're an alumni and you bring kind of that fan perspective too, because I think that's a good mix. My last question, and I always like to ask everyone that comes on the pod this, what, what is your favorite MSU basketball memory, if you had to choose just one? Man. It's a big question, I know. Yeah, I was so young for the national title game, mm -hmm. you know, and I wasn't 100% into following them like I became later in life. So, it, like, obviously the national title is great, but I don't, like, I didn't have, like, yeah. a, you know, fond memory of that. Mm -hmm. um, man, I, I think probably that recent win over Duke with the team that they had to make the yeah. final four, even though they ended up falling short. Um, you know, kind of ran out of steam. Cash was on one leg there, and they just mm -hmm. had kind of a slim roster. They didn't have it 100% filled out. But um, I thought that that win, like I was watching it at home, some of my closest Spartan friends were over. Mm -hmm. Um, and when that went in and we won the game, I remember we just hugged, we just yeah. hugged each other. It was a bunch of <laughs> and just hugging each other. And that to me, in that moment, beating Coach K after he's just beat the shit out of Izzo year mm -hmm. after year with three top 10 picks, lottery picks on the roster and Michigan State was able to overcome one of the most dominant college basketball players of the last yeah. like 25 years in Zion Williamson. I thought that that was just a special, special moment you almost saw the disbelief on Izzo's face when that went mm -hmm. in. Um, and for Kenny Goins, a, a, wa a former walk-on to yeah. hit the shot against three top ten picks, I, that's what March is all about and what college basketball is. So that that is definitely one of the fonder ones. But I'm hoping this team can maybe make some new ones for us and – Perhaps we'll get to see another Final Four run, and if we do, uh, I will be there hoping it ends in a title, so we'll see. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, that's a great memory, and I think it's a good measure when grown men are hugging each other that it's, you know, it's a moment that will go down in history. I like that. I'll use that as my measure for the future. Okay, so, that's perfect. Either yeah. crying or hugging. I think <laughs> that's very true. Very true. Two opposite ends. Yeah. So... Thank you very much for coming on the pod today. Um, give him a follow on Twitter and check out his website. He does great work over there. And thank you for listening to Red Cedar Radar. Hit the subscribe button and we'll be back next week.